I asked many questions and then this is the answer that came. And then I audited the infrastructure, which is the next slide. And I asked them to say where they, the problematic areas. And based on the methodology that we developed based on best practice from different parts of the world, we audited the infrastructure, we walked around the neighborhood and we identified the problem areas and they were identical to the areas that we audited. So the, actually the people who are using the street are actually well aware where the problem areas are. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is Dima Abruzic from Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. And we are gonna be talking about some of the exciting things that are happening in walking and biking in the Dubai area. Uh, let's jump into it with Dima. Dima, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you, John, for having me. Uh, I always like to give my guests just an opportunity to introduce themselves. So uh, who is Dima? Um, um, I'm an urban designer based in Dubai. Um, I'm passionate about cities and I'm passionate about design. I feed my passion with reading and uh, um, watching uh, YouTube and listen, taking courses and uh, traveling to everything related to cities. And I'm so fortunate to be able to travel with my children and my, my two boys and my husband to different cities around the world. In the past five years, I uh, became more and more focused on um, cycling and walking as a means to inform my practice and uh, like as a catalyst for positive urban change in our environment when it comes to inclusivity, uh, affordability, environmental sustainability, and uh, quite frankly, joy. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah frank, quite frankly, joy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like about being, having fun, like yeah, urban yeah. spaces where yeah, you can walk yeah. and cycle are much more fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to pull up this map here because uh, mm. a uh, you're you're not originally from that area. You're actually uh, yeah. originally from Jordan, uh, but you also have uh, ties to Texas too. Yeah, <laughs> you remember. So yeah, I um, I, wa I was born and raised in Jordan, and I moved to the UAE with my husband to work. Um, um, UAE is the United Arab Emirates and Dubai is uh, one of the Emirates. Emirates are like equivalent to um, states in the US. So U U UAE is a federal system and the UAE uh, and Dubai is a, is a state in that country. And uh, yeah, so uh, I've been here since 2005. But um, the rest of my family are all over, like all over the U.S., frankly, and uh, my sister lives uh, in uh, like your neighbor in San Antonio, one of them. Yeah, 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 just 90 miles to the south of me here in Austin. So uh, hopefully one of these days we'll be able to uh, uh, connect with each other in person if you have an opportunity yeah, to, very soon, to visit. Very soon. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you, I, I owe you a, a bicycle tour of our Dutch inspired cycle network here in uh, in the Austin area because we've been building out, uh, you know, that over the last decade or so. And you and I know some of the same people in the Dutch cycling embassy and, uh, and, and some of the folks that have uh, really helped assist us in helping to build out that cycling network. And I love giving tours to folks that uh, are able to make it to Austin. And if I'm around, if I'm available, I'd, I love uh, giving uh, bike tours around the area. I can't wait. Yeah, that's good stuff. Um, and so you connected with me a, a few months ago and you were super, super excited about this opportunity, as you just mentioned, you know, to getting inspired about creating some joy and creating uh, and promoting active mobility. And talk a little bit about that inspiration, the nugget. What, what were some of the key things that really inspired you to want to transform the built environment into healthier, more active, promoting places? So as an urban designer, I worked in different roles. In Jordan, my role was back, back home in Jordan. I was in research and we were focused on water conserving landscapes and like gray water use because Jordan faces uh, like major challenges related to water scarcity. But then when I moved to the UAE, the scale changed and the, the priorities changed and the timeline of implementation of projects changed. So I worked for 13 years in a multidisciplinary engineering firm and uh, I worked as master planner, master planning brownfields and like greenfield developments, mostly in, in the United Arab Emirates. And then um, I moved to uh, 
from to the other side to a real estate developer, a design led real estate developers. And you here mostly the like you have a, a big design team within the developers. So not, they don't only rely on consultants. They will be a design team within the developer. Where I worked on the top right project, it's a brownfield redevelopment of an army base in uh, one of the cities in uh, in the UAE. And uh, some blocks we designed ourselves and some blocks we ten tendered as competition. And this competition specifically was won by Zaha Hadid Architects. And they um, developed this concept of like bubbles in the middle of a, the desert, like water being a scarce resource in the desert. And a um, few of these bubbles are already constructed. So I was like working on the public run design, on the construction aspect and on the urban uh, design aspect. And then during COVID, which a lot of people did, we like you, you pivot. Right. I, I would say that it, throughout my role, I was looking at cycling, cycling and walking uh, more and more. But then I worked with the government. I moved to a government role where it's called the Roads and Transport Authority, RTA. And I was part of the strategic planning team I'm responsible for um, promoting walking and cycling mobility. And uh, this is where we built, worked on the infrastructure that you can see in the bottom photos, which are like dedicated uh, off-street uh, cycle tracks in different parts of the city. Wow. Yeah. And and talk a little bit about that culture of uh, trying to encourage people to uh, to walk and bike more. Is that a huge challenge in, in the UAE? Well, like I have my story of how cycling and walking get, um, evolved in the UAE. But um, I'll, uh, like uh, in general, Dubai is a, a city made up to 3.6 million uh, inhabitants. I, uh, 10 of them are the UAE nationals and 90% are expatriates from different parts of the world. Oh, so wow. the, the, yeah. the, the culture, the, I would say it's only a Dubai culture whereby everybody comes here together and they, we, like, they put together a culture that is a, like a Dubai culture per se. So the city, maybe we have a photo, like a slide of, uh, of the story of how cycling and walking evolved. Maybe it would be like, you can skip down. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's skip a co over a couple. So this is a, the overhead of... The, one of the brownfield developments that I told you about, it was an army base and we were developing this, uh, this uh, city. In, in terms of scale of this development, it's 70,000 people. It will like host 70,000 people and it will be built over... Five, uh, 10 years. So this is the, the, the scale that I was working on as a developer. But we can skip to the photo where it shows the different snapshots of, um, of uh, cycling infrastructure in the city. Uh, but but I, will, I will talk uh, while, we're, while we're talking. So Dubai is famous for this photo as well, <laughs> yeah, which is, is <laughs> like a car-centric, state-of-the-art, modern infrastructure. Um, there's also um, a metro, and it was one of the first few metros that was introduced in, in this region. Yeah. Um, um, uh, and then... Um, All right, uh, I was going to say, you know, yeah. are you yeah. sure you didn't just steal this photo from, from Texas? Uh, no, but, <laughs> but it's like some people, some people uh, equate, like they, they think of Dubai as LA more than Texas, maybe because it's facing the water. But however, the, the leadership uh, uh, and the government of Dubai uh, early on realized that the uh, concept of wellness and uh, um, attracting the skilled uh, force, uh, the skilled, uh, like skilled people, and also to um, improve the well-being of the people, we have to pivot away like, uh, and improve the sustainability of our city and use of resources. So uh, a network uh, of uh, cycling infrastructure um, grew in the city. Some of them were for leisure and some of them were in the desert for exercise and some were around the metro stations where it uh, like serves to do the first and last mile. And um, as I told you, you can see uh, like a unique story that's not associated with the brand, like, with, with what people think of the way they think of it as like those famous buildings, like the one in the background of this photo, Burj Al Arab, and the other iconic buildings. But there is another, another story to be told about the uh, cycling and mobility um, here in, in, in the city. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned a couple of things there. You mentioned, uh, you know, wellness and well-being and being able to attract and retain people. And so you start to you're starting to get into some of those quality of life things. But then you also layered in some of the practicality of like, yeah, first and last mile associated with using transit. Definitely. 
like what we saw before is a cycle track on the beach and the ruler of Dubai, the, the Sheikh Mohammed, the ruler of Dubai was riding with his, uh, with his uh, team. Uh, this photo shows a unique transport mode, I would say, in Dubai, which is the connection between metro and scooter. So the electric scooters and the personally personally owned scooters. So uh, Dubai Metro is um, was built like so far in three phases. It does not cover the whole city because the city is made of the, like cent- urban centers and with c- and CBDs and connected with this uh, with this metro. However, there's low density developments like close and far from the city center. So um, the distances. Like the the scooter became a crucial role in this uh, played a crucial role in this weather specifically in the hot weather and that the metro is not covering a whole city that a lot of people who use the metro the metro and then take the scooter fold it with them and then take it out and finish the last mile and maybe the last mile is not a mile maybe it's five kilometers like I I think in kilometers I don't think in miles maybe it's two miles but the scooter gave them that. Uh, opportunity and that freedom to do that. So it's a unique uh, thing here. Personally owned scooters, not shared scooters, not specifically e-bikes because e-bikes, you can't fold them. So it's actually the electric scooters. They made they make a lot, a big part of the mobility, like the, the active, or some people don't think it's active mobility, but for me, I think it's also solving a solution to trans- sustainable mobility. Sure, sure. S- more, more sustainable mobility and the ability to use some of the same infrastructure that we put in place, uh, you know, for you know, getting uh, off of the uh, potentially high speed network, you're on a lower speed network. And so, yeah, you see that mixing of, uh, you know, the e-bikes and the e-scooters and the regular bikes, you know, they're all sort of mixing and mingling, uh, in the cycle networks and the, the cycle paths. And, um, yeah, that makes, makes sense. And this also makes sense too, that this would be a very practical solution to the distances that you're re- referencing. Cause when we get to, you know, that, that five kilometer range or three kilometer range, you know, somewhere between two and three miles, that's longer than somebody's going to be willing to walk especially if it's in a hotter environment. Yeah, that's exactly it. And the, the barrier to entry for the scooter, the cost of owning a scooter compared to an e-bike, the, the ease of like mobility when you're moving a scooter from one place to another, you can take it into elevators, you can take it, you can... Uh, so it's actually, um, it's a unique... Uh, like I haven't seen it in when I travel that much, as much as I see it in Dubai when it comes to personally owned uh, scooters. Let me talk a, a little bit about the quality of the those personally owned uh, e-scooters. Uh, some of the the high profile news things are from some of the cheaper uh, devices that are made and the uh, fires, the battery fires that take place. And even you you may remember the mobility devices, the the hoverboard type things that they were they were catching on fire because they were very very poorly made. They weren't built to standards, uh, you know, UL standards and things of that nature. And so uh, they suddenly were banned from being on airplanes. They were banned from being on transit. They're you know in some cases they're even being banned from being in apartment buildings because they keep catching on fire. Um, do we do you get the sense that the these machines are built at a high quality? They have those sort of standards uh, versus really cheap products that have that risk of of safety compromises, especially if you're bringing it on the metro. Mm, I haven't uh, like when I worked in RTA or during my like uh, existing in this space, I haven't like heard about these incidences incidents right now. But I don't um, think that because it's this uh, high quality or not high quality, I think because it's a new phenomena here and it is uh, it's like we're yet to see what, what's going to like if there are any incidents as such. Yeah, I don't like. I think that they are made of a premium material or anything like that. They are, they would be a mixed basket of premium and uh, lower quality. And however, it hasn't been the challenge or the barrier. The barrier has been safety. Right. So, and We're you, get to like, that. As, yeah, so <laughs> that, that is, 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 uh, is what the perception. So here I'm showing you that that photo is the, uh, the ruler of Dubai. He's just indoor, like he shows a photo of him endorsing an urban structure plan for the a spatial plan for the city 
It's called Dubai 2040. And that plan actually will draw that what, what Dubai will look like in the next 20 years. And it's been endorsed at the highest level. So this is a major, major because the, the major statement and objective of this plan is to improve the quality of life and make Dubai the best city in the world for people to live and play and uh, use resources effectively. So that's why I like chose to uh, put, because this is uh, guiding the actions of every government agency and every like semi-government agency in the city. So this is the umbrella that is encompassing all the governance on the policy, on the project prioritization that's happening in the city. Yeah. Is it a sort of a friendly competition between the other members in, in the UAE? It's uh, it's uh, definitely a friendly competition <laughs> between yeah. the whole region. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah uh, because everybody's competing for the same um, workforce and for the same tourists. So definitely um, it's a friendly competition. And uh, even um, within the government of Dubai, there is like a, an award called the Dubai um, Excellence Award. And it's between the different government agencies. That's unique to Dubai, actually whereby the ruler himself, like he is all about accountability and about responsibility and about roles. So every agency, like they set the strategy, everybody has a KPIs and there is a, uh, there is a clear way of how to reach a KPI in the next yeah, quarter, year, five years. And, uh, and uh, that excellence awards that uh, every government agency has a KPI to meet satisfaction of people. Of the, uh, so, and uh, at the end of the year, the best and the worst agencies are publicized and they will say why so there's a there is competition but i think it's very very healthy uh it's very healthy yeah yeah uh you you used an acronym kpi mm -hmm. why don't you uh, define yeah. that for the audience kpi is the key performance indicator yeah. so if i would say like i want to make dubai friendly dubai as a cycling friendly city uh, some Asian, some cities will say that we want to have like a mode share. We want to the cycle like in the overall cycling or travel trips within the city. The cycling will be five percent or two percent, and every city around the world they will set their own KPIs. And however, when setting the KPIs, we need to be mindful that the KPI is actually not about uh, things that people will not feel. So, so I like one KPI when it comes to cycling in London is that they will measure uh, how far is any resident from a cycle track or an off-street cycle track or right. some people talk about nodes and networks instead of tracks so I, I like that more than the length of the tracks or or uh, some some agencies do that some agencies do that but uh, that's uh, that's a KPI yeah and, and we see here that the the cycling tracks the story. Yeah. yeah it really is a, is a success story in the sense that yeah, we're not putting in the context of what accessibility is for, for the population, but at the same time, that's pretty impressive. It's grown tremendously from, from 2006 at just nine kilometers uh, to 544 kilometers in, in 2022. And then as you're, you're pointing out, okay, let's also overlay the KPI of how accessible is this to, uh, you know, the, the populace? Can they get to those uh, facilities? And, and also, I would say, what do those facilities um, actually serve? Are they, you know, actually connecting people to meaningful destinations? Or are they, you know, more of recreation? Not that that's a problem, but we, we would love to see uh, a multitude of uses for the facilities that are that are put in place. In other words, yes, it can be for recreation, but it also can serve meaningful destinations. So definitely, I uh, this is something you told me about, and uh, the more uh, it, which is the culture of activity. Sometimes it uh, it uh, feeds in the active mobility and the transportation. And uh, initially, I was uh, like my motto was uh, cycling and walking as a transport, not sport. However, more and more, I'm learning that, especially in the story of Dubai, the people who are for, uh, promoting the, the sport, the, the, the people who are doing sports, uh, cycling as a sport, are more and more um, transitioning into um, making it cycling as a, as a, like a daily commute uh, thing. So it's, um, it's actually serving because we're both, we both want the cycling, uh, like safe cycling infrastructure. So this, this, this slide specifically will tell you about the story of cycling in Dubai. So I'll briefly um, start from the top left, which is showing two um, uh, gardeners um, uh, leaving from their 
like a, a low density development and heading to their like homes, I'm assuming, because they have like some gardening equipment. And cycling initially was two things, which is the bottom, the top layer. Uh, of the photos one was people who don't have access to cars will use cycling to go in and in from the, the places of work to their place the residences then cycling was also a leisure activity on the waterfront which is the top right uh, photo that was on waterfronts around parks etc that was the initial story however with the uh, uh, opening of the metro in 2009 we had, um, uh, we had to create an in- integrated network around uh, metro stations. And then at the same time, a new track to, uh, was built in the desert, which shows Al-Qudra cycle track. It's a cycle track. It's a 90-kilometer cycle track. It's the longest in the world. I think it has the Guinness World Record. It's an off-street cycle track in the middle of soft sand dunes and like a beautiful scenery. And the story of that specific cycle track is super interesting a group of, I think, German, uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember, but they were a group of um, um, expats who get, get together and on weekends and cycle on the desert roads outside the city early in the morning when they're very quiet. And the group grew from 4 to 10 to 30. And in the morning, they will, uh, the ruler of Dubai, himself, Sheikh Mohammed, will drive past them, say hello, or wait behind them until they cross or they pass and then like slowly walk around, slowly drive over because he had uh, like a, a home in the like on, on around that uh, that area in the ruler part of the of the city. However, one day the, he rolled down his window. He waited for them and he rolled down his window and he said, "Guys, cycling on the road, your the group is growing bigger and bigger and it's fantastic. However, you need maybe uh, like what do you need to make this safer?" And that's how it all evolved. So yeah. uh, um, somebody said, yeah, just months, give us our own path. <laughs> exactly. And within four months, uh, six months, uh, like the Roads and Transport Authority, the Sports Council, the police got together. Uh, the tra- uh, they, they spoke to the, the athletes and the athletes told them, yeah, an off street cycle track, maybe four meters, maybe two directional. What kind of services do you need? Lighting? Do you need end of trip facilities? And the, that track right now is one of the most popular tracks and sports actually cycling. Uh, became part Dubai Dubai tour. There is a Dubai cycling tour. It became um, like a part of the European tour. I'm not sure. I don't follow that uh, tour specifically, but I know that that there's a big hype when they come to the city. And in the winter months in Dubai, the weather becomes better. So you have European teams coming here and training. So um, uh, then what, after they built it in the desert, now they're connecting it in the city because people want, like every community now, they want to connect to that track. So, right. so it's, uh, it's interesting how it all happened. Then we're moving to the last uh, row, which is, uh, shows the Dubai vision focusing on the well-being. So they closed the, one of the main thoroughfares of the city, or it is the main thoroughfares of the city. It's six by six lanes, cutting the city in half. It's like a river. And they, cut it, they close it for six hours um, once a year. For a, like a, a cycling event, like a ciclovia uh, event, uh, uh, it's not a race, but it's a ride. Like it's a leisurely ride, and uh, it's one of those days of the way that uh, like the energy and the joy, and it's electric. People are lying on asphalt, taking photos, and and uh, so and with the more and more people are adopting cycling and walking as mode of transport in the city. Um, of course, it's not uh, it, it's not like right now cycling. Amount uh, mode share is less than two percent. Uh, the aim is to get it to three percent in the next four years. The walking uh, is around, I think, what's, um, I think thirteen percent mode share. And uh, this, but this, the, these two numbers do not count the scooters as well. So the aim is to increase these trips and um, and definitely connect them to the metro because of the weather. So not, people are not anticipating that uh, people will, will cycle for eight kilometers, or etc. People will like connect to uh, first uh, for, for with the public transport and then do like a cycling or walking trip. Yeah, yeah, fascinating, fascinating, and it it, it also sort of um, points to what you had said earlier about how many of the people in Dubai and in the cities and states uh, in the United Arab Emirates are people coming in from other countries. And so they have other cultures. And so, and, and like you said too, you know, in, in this particular photo, you, you may have a situation where uh, they, they can't afford to, to have an automobile. And so 
they, they sort of lean towards, okay, well, what are the most practical ways for me to be able to get around? And as the, the network starts to develop, you may see even more people say, oh, it's, it's affordable and practical for me to be able to get around by bike. And that helps out a, a great deal for these individuals that don't have the finances available to, to drive a car. And as you said, it's not a mode only for the people who can, don't have access to cars. Right. So it's a mode for a, like it's evolving. And don't forget that we have lots of tourists. So we have uh, like 20 million people coming to the city um, uh, each year. So these people will walk. They will expect, you know, when you reach a destination, you like in, in the brain, vacations means more walking, more walking. Right, so right. it's uh, and they are the gel, I would say between the residents and expatriates and everybody. So it's it's not, it, it, it's a new, like, uh, it's not only for the people who don't own cars or, or have access to cars, it's becoming more and more to everybody. So, and the distribution of the metro, it links different kinds of neighborhoods. So if we're looking at cycling between different neighborhoods, it's actually, um, the metro is linking with that. And the last thing is, as I would say, the beach is a public beach here. So the beach is a place where everybody comes to. Right. So, and we have a 30 kilometer cycle track on the water. So it's actually a place for everybody. It's not only um, for the people who have access to cars or not. Yeah. And then here's the, you already uh, uh, talked a little bit about the figures here in terms of the percentages and all of that. And we see that we have a, a, a target of 3% of the uh, share of cycling trips uh, for 2025. So in a couple of years, we would like to see a doubling of, of that. And what you, the point that you just made too, in terms of the expectations of the visitors and the tourists that are coming, I'm assuming that, that uh, are those is the data from from tourists included in walking and cycling trips or is this mostly okay so this somehow captures that those those numbers as well okay. yeah 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 it's uh, of course we always say that uh, counting will, will uh, like tri- walking trips are not counted as good as car trips however these are the figures that we have and i think that there's more work to be done to improve the walking condition for tourists, especially because the connectivity of the network needs a lot of improvement. But uh, the vision is is definitely to to move that, and that th- that's why all of us in this space right now are working hard to to meet because the vision is really aggressive. So we really want to uh, work that hard. This photo shows actually a cycle track next to my place. So you you have different different shapes of cycle tracks in the city, and the majority is off street. Uh, the majority is shared between walking and cycling. And however, when it comes to um, a high popul- high, uh, like an area where there's so much population, so much walking, people walking, then the, the cycle track stops. So uh, we're not talking about busy areas, busy downtowns with walking and cycling shared. If it's less, if it's quiet, then you can have shared uh, infrastructure. Cycling on asphalt or on shared surfaces with cars is limited here. And which I... I am um, uh, like uh, I agree with, and the uh, people actually, if you look at the most popular tracks, are the tracks which are always off street and not shared with cars. Right, right, and and part of the reason for you stating that you're f- in favor of that is because I would assume that the motor vehicles are traveling at uh, too high a speed, and so it wouldn't feel comfortable. And not only high, the motor vehicles are the majority. Right. So if yeah. any surface, and that's what like you always talk about, and the, all the like um, advocates are talking about, if the car is the majority and the cycling and, and the walking are the minority, then it, sharing sur- surface does not work. We have to be the majority. The, the people on foot or on cycling should be the majority, and then the car as a guest. That's the only way it works. The speed, the design speed. It, okay, the posted speed may be thirty. Right. But the design speed is higher than that. And the behavior is on another level. And the type of vehicles, the SUVs, the exp- and, and to be honest, I don't want to, like also I have to be fair for the motorists, is that they don't expect you because there's not many of you, you know? So that's the, another, another thing. So it, separating them, definitely, um, I'm, I'm a product. 
Yeah, yeah. So this photo, we, we see a, uh, a bike share station and the, the title of the, the slide here is Infrastructure Improvements. Is, is bike share a, a thing? Or is that? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Actually, uh, one of my, like, uh, I'm very close to the operators of the bike share uh, scheme here. It's called Kareem. It's one of the first all electric uh, sharing schemes. It's actually not dockless. It's on, on docks. And um, uh, they're all e-bikes and uh, they're growing exponentially. And uh, I think they're one of the largest electric bike sharing uh, schemes in the whole world. Um, yeah, and the, the cost of like, making a yearly subscription becomes extremely affordable. It's less than like if you take the yearly subscription and divide it over um, a day, like a day. So it's like less than $1 a day to use wow. that their okay. e-bike uh, e-bike and it's an e-bike so e-bikes are not cheap and um, but if they are mostly around metro stations it's growing and it's um, it's really really um uh, giving it a, a very nice service in the city and when you look at the people who are using this system, um, it seems like you're leaning towards encouraging uh, actual residents who are using the metro systems uh, to do that. And then uh, versus, you know, just having them located in the tourist areas and like near the beach and blah, 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 which you can do both. Um, but th this is an indication that you have a an annual pass which would lean towards a resident, uh, as well as situating them near the transit stops, which really emphasizes that, yeah, we're talking about people who are living and working here. And then that next step to that is we've got to have the infrastructure in place to get them to their meaningful destinations. Yeah. That Definitely. last mile. And like you were talking about. Yeah. And connecting it to meaningful like uh, locations. So it's uh, e-bikes are ex like pivotal in that, in delivering that, especially that there are e-bikes. As I said, the weather here, usually um, uh, it's pleasant for six, seven months a year and like less than 40 Celsius, or, I would say, or and then January, the weather is 27 Celsius. So it's very pleasant. However, that we have three months of uh, like um, really hot uh, conditions, humid conditions in July, August and September. And uh, according to the e-bikes, uh, e-bike provider, they say that they don't, they only see a 10% drop in the number of trips in when it comes to when, it, when it's really hot in the high density uh, neighborhoods. In two, we have a CBD and they told us it's one of their most popular uh, 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 trips and uh, number of trips. And one of them is the tourist area as well. And they don't they only see a 10 percent drop between summer and winter months because of uh, that it's electric. And what's interesting too, I'm glad you brought that up because you know you're you're talking about temperatures that are very similar to the temperatures here in Texas in central and, and southern Texas, as you well know, since your family's down in San Antonio. So we get very very hot in the summertime. We've got three months where people are like, oh my gosh, would you even bother riding? And I'm like, yeah, I, I ride through the year because when you're on that electric assist bike, you you're creating your own wind, and even though it's brutally hot out, it's actually not bad. It's it's actually pretty comfortable. And we see the same sort of trend in that uh, we only see a little bit of a dip during the hottest, hottest times. And and honestly, it, it, it works. And when you have that little bit of an electric assist, it really helps even out, uh, you know, whether you have hills or whether you have hot and, or even extremely cold weather. It's sort of an equalizer to that. So that's that's very good. I am painting a rosy picture, but I'm just saying there's so much work to be done. So oh, yeah, in totally, terms of totally. climate comfort. So definitely a tree here, like more trees are needed, more shade is needed, more, the cycle tracks that are like protected from the weather conditions. And uh, weather here is more extreme than the weather in uh, in Texas because oh, sure, uh, sure. Yeah, it's it's hotter and we have like sand it, it rains in more in in uh, maybe there's more l landscape in in texas because it rains, l rains more i'm not sure about austin but i remember in houston it used to rain a lot so it's uh, it's extreme but there's more work to be done so definitely the more people will ride the more there will be pressure to improve the, the user experience of these uh, tracks. Yeah. And I was going to say that, you know, one of the most important equalizers too, to, to extreme conditions is, yeah, it's nice to have that electric assist. But the other thing that's the most important part is what we have on screen now, which is we have to build meaningful 
uh, or, or excuse me, we, we have to build authentic all ages and abilities facilities that really help to encourage that. Because if you do that, then people will ride, whether it's brutally, brutally cold or brutally, brutally hot. They will ride them if you've got truly inviting, safe and inviting infrastructure that they can utilize because it's one less friction point. It's one less barrier for people to do that. It's uh, like, uh, for example, Singapore. Um, The weather in Singapore is all year humid and hot. And yet, because of the uh, myriad of uh, interventions by the government in terms of uh, uh, the cost to owning a car, the barriers to owning a car, the, a compact urban fabric, a very connected public transport network, uh, all of that, a safe uh, uh, off-street uh, network, a beautiful or an attractive off-street network as well, like those uh, those. Uh, Greenways, so it made it all more vibrant to make to to move people from walking and cycling. I understand that this might not happen throughout Dubai because we have low density development and high density areas. However, um, high density areas are the lowest. Like for high density areas, this is the lowest hanging fruit to improve conditions. And to be honest, I, I'll just say something like, walk schools close in the summer. And schools make a lot of the trips and a lot of the congestion that's happening in our cities right now. They don't have to do these trips when it's really, really hot. However, when during my work in schools, they tell me that we have the same congestion and problems around schools in January when the weather is super present and in June when the weather is like really, really hot. So the weather is not, it's clearly not the barrier, oh, one, not the major barrier when it comes to um, the behavior and the car centric uh, lifestyle. So there are other things at play, and civil is another option. Uh, civil uh, is a civilia is a, is another um, uh, um, example. Civilia enjoys a very nice scale because it's like a compact, uh, cute. <laughs> it's a, it's a network. I've been there in the summer. It's really 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 hot and it's really 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 dry. Uh, however, people adjust. Like I noticed that, for example. Uh, we have dinner early, like when we travel, because we're traveling with the kids. And when we are on the roads between six and eight in the evening, there's nobody there. Like it's only us because people shift, shift their like uh, lifestyle between summer and winter and, uh, and adjust really. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I've uh, pulled up a few photos uh, from a a very special little uh, tour that you did uh, because you wanted to really absorb, you know, from, and you and I had chatted a little bit before you committed to to doing uh, this particular uh, study tour. Talk talk a little bit about what you did and and why you did it. And and I'm noticing that there's, you're wearing a shirt that I kind of recognize. What, What is that? Yeah. Yeah, just like my mug, streets are for yeah. Thank you very much for doing that, and and I and I bring that up simply because uh, part of the reason why I got inspired to do uh you know shirts that are, say streets are for people and mugs that do that is because I it really got driven home for me in the Netherlands because uh, uh, about seventy percent of their entire network their cycle network is actually some form of shared street space like the feet struts and the and the very very low volume low speed residential streets and so what we think of when we think of the Dutch network is definitely the protected and separated pathways but in reality it's a big part of it is the fact that they really do embrace the fact that streets are for people. And so it's an interesting dynamic that they've been able to get to because there's a little bit of both. There's the the protected and separated and then there's also the shared. I haven't been I haven't had a chance to do a complete debrief uh, from your visit and your study tour. And so uh, why don't you set this up and explain what it is you did, because you did something very, very special when you were over there. Definitely. I, uh, I love traveling and I, uh, like, I'm very lucky that my husband loves traveling as well. And we always explore different destinations on foot. When I graduated, my degree was architecture in school. So when I used to travel to cities, it was like, we would like draw a map of the buildings that I want to see. And then we would like walk around the city to see these buildings. And many times the like a, a, an interesting building will be outside of the city district, city, like uh, tourist area and people will be surprised to see us there but because of like we're following something however more and more when i like i think the practice changed and we changed with it 
um, uh, it, I started more focusing on urban urban design and urban uh, urban uh, and streets and like life and I think there was a, like a, I think there was a, a specific shift at one point. I can't like put a, my picture on it and put a finger on it, but there was a shift in practice where we started looking at place rather than iconic buildings. And from Dima, myself, I, because I'm always looking at sustainability and inclusivity, like it made sense. So having been an employee all my time, all this time, I could not have the luxury to take off and do those fantastic cycling tour everybody talks about, such as you, you, when you go around the world. When, when, when I left my last role at the RTA, we didn't mention that I started a, uh, like an advisory firm uh, focused on promoting cycling and walking mobility in our region. And the, the, one of the like, highlights was that I will be able to control my time and um, do a cycling study tour. And I found that there is a bubble of like-minded people on the internet, on podcasts, on books. And uh, I reached out to you and um, asked you about a number of options, which cycling tour I, I should take. And uh, you said, Dima, you cannot go wrong. Like they're all fantastic. And I chose this, which was designed, uh, designed by or organized by Sensible Transport Institute. It's a group from Australia. And uh, we were um, a group of like uh, uh, people from Australia, different kinds of governance. We were the people from the States. We had um, um, a mayor from um, San Francisco metropolitan area. We had one of um, a northern uh, state of New York in the northern part of the state of New York and myself. So a group of 11 people spent maybe eight days in the Netherlands touring different. It was not only looking at cycling and walking. It was looking about the ecosystem of sustainable mobility and land use planning and urban planning and parking and electric and trains and community and service and behavior. It was fantastic. We met the usual like the celebrities in cycling, like Marco and uh, these people and Mark. However, we also, I, th- they were fantastic and they delivered on what I like uh, expected the presentation to be, the, the, ex- the experience to be. But there were also like some very nice gems when we went to the, um, the train provider, how they talk about service and how they measure satisfaction. We had one tour, which is on the left, we met with the um, land use planners from university, from the mayor of Utrecht and land use planners from the municipality of Utrecht, and they took us around fantastic infrastructure around the city, and they would answer questions like, "What is the density? How much does this cost?" And all of us, like you, you're like feeding the curiosity all the time. And this is a photo. What, the last thing I also enjoyed in this uh, trip, not only like being around like-minded people, being in my own, like enjoying myself, being active, learning, and you know, when you practice, you don't learn, uh, you don't get that fantastic atmosphere of being in a classroom but that gave us that at the same time as an adult not as a student as, a, as a, 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 a young person and the last thing is that the amazing thing about the Netherlands is that the cycling infrastructure can be iconic you know iconic now became that dirty word or sexy became like a dirty word but the cycling infrastructure there is like is is a, is definitely iconic like it's not a bad word to say iconic it's just it's like places for people what do you think yeah yeah, no, I think it's great. Yeah, really, really good point. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And I'm I'm really super super stoked that you had this opportunity uh, to do this. And you know, it it th- this is a, a just a little bit of a video. We'll kind of let this play in the background. It's you know some of the, some of the iconic images, uh, the well known images of you know the 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 the, can- the canals and the boats going through that. Now, was that your first visit ever to the Netherlands or is that? No, I've been many times. Okay. I've okay, been good, actually many good. times, but this is my yeah. first time to Utrecht. Yeah, this is the first time to like, I'm studying this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and usually, actually, to be honest, when I go to the Netherlands, I don't cycle because it's very intimidating, extremely intimidating for someone from the outside. I would like cycle for two hours and like just, uh, just walk. It's safe, much safer to walk. However, Utrecht, uh, provided a safe, safe opportunity for someone like me. It's really, um, uh, it's really, um, it's been, it's been fantastic. And actually, it's nice to visit. Like I always tell my friends, it's like a better Amsterdam, like a cleaner Amsterdam, a more right, right. Amsterdam. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, people around the water, they were like paddle boards. They were like um, um, swimming. and It was a heat wave, of course. And it was, uh, uh, children were swimming. It felt, 
it, the, the, the scale is like San Antonio, you know, the water level and there are shops. However, it's, uh, it's, it's also Amsterdam. So it's uh, like, if people don't think about Utrecht as a tourist destination, it's like a university town and it's like a working town, but it's really, really nice. Like, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It really is. It's it's fantastic. It also happens to be one of the busiest, uh, you know, central cha- train That's stations. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a major major hub. And I also see uh, in the top right photo here, uh, if we look up there, you know, to the top right, that looks like that's the new parking structure in Amsterdam. Yes, yes, we've been to yeah. the new. Oh, new! Have you seen it? So I haven't I, been I there yet. No, you? it was still yeah, under yeah, construction yeah. last November yeah. when I was there. Yeah. So yeah. It's uh, it's um, like it's really high quality and the finishes and the lighting uh, like it's not harsh. You don't feel like even it's a metro station. It's also seamless. The speed, uh, f- male, female, the, the staff are smiling. Some of some people I heard, they think of it as a cathedral, like the, the <laughs> columns and the lighting. So it's really like um, um, um well, what, not what you yeah. expect from a parking structure, yeah. you know, yeah, like so a parking it, structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good point. I mean, one of the things that I really talk about here at the Active Towns uh, Initiative is that if we want to see behavior change, if we're, we're trying to change the way people are getting around and we're in a car dominated society, we really need to think about things in a way that says, OK, how can we encourage Uh, and support behavior change? How can we encourage and support doing things a little bit different? And one of the things that we can do so from a a behavior change perspective is make it pleasant, is make the experience enjoyable, is make the experience convenient. And when you do start doing these things, you start ticking these things off, you start to realize that, oh yeah, for 80 hundred years, we've been making driving everywhere for everything the most convenient, the most pleasant. If we can start making walking and biking that way too, including providing high quality, secure, clean bike parking facilities that facilitate the use of transit, voila. I mean, you're able to do some really, really cool stuff. So that's great. Now, you're doing all of this and you and I have been talking about this for the better part of almost a year now of preparation for that next phase, because you have a dream that you want to bring these concepts there to the UAE. And that brings us around to your very first workshop. Yeah. Yay. Yes. Yeah. 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 So um, um, uh, when, when we talk about promoting cycling and walking uh, any, in any part of the world, um, education, we have like, we have to raise awareness. We have to change policy. And we have improved to improve skills, okay, and data, of course. However, when it comes to skills, you know that worldwide there there is a, a gap in um, skilled engineers, landscape architects, urban designers, um, government officials in promote how to promote cycling and walking. And it does not take one uh, infrastructure improvement; it takes like uh, everybody working together to improve that uh, to to promote uh, that aspect or to make that uh, that shift. So I uh, knew when I started Street Design Team, which is the startup focus on promoting walking and cycling uh, in here, which is less than a year old, um, that workshops and bringing workshops in Dubai, taking people from their offices and sitting together with like-minded people or not with like-minded people and changing perspectives is key. So that was part of the reason that I took the time to, to go to the Netherlands. Was how, however, and I take always time to travel around the world. I didn't only go to the Netherlands, by the way. I connected it with at like a Euro tour uh, to look at the different infrastructure in different parts of the world. But however, in different parts of Europe, however, um, uh, not everybody can take that time. Remember that I have been in this space for a very long time, but in taking that time away and studying and bringing the, uh, uh, like uh, taking that, it, it's, not, it's not doable for everyone and it's not scalable. So I, uh, through like a very nice network of supporters, I was able to um, work with the consulate of the Netherlands here in Dubai and uh, with the Dutch Cycling Embassy and the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water in the Netherlands who made a pledge in COP27 last uh, year to train 10,000 professionals around the world to, uh, on, in, on active travel. And um, we made it happen. So we, last week, we um, uh, and, uh, may, created the first the workshop to promote active travel in Dubai. We invited, the, because of the ministry um, and the agenda, we invited 
mostly people from government agencies. However, we also invited people from the private sector. We had people from the Bay Police. We had people from the Knowledge Authority, like the Education Authority. We had people from the Roads and Transport Authority. We had developers in the region and the real estate from real estate development. And we had the, the Sports Council, which was very interesting. I'll tell you about it in a bit. And uh, we had uh, the Karim bike sharing. And we sat in, uh, I, of course, and it was facilitated by, by myself and the and experts from the Dutch Cycling Embassy and the ministry, also um, the president from the ministry, also spoke about the policy level. So, um, uh, it, and we did a cycling tour. We, we, we solved some case studies and the findings were extremely interesting. Yeah. Overall, how would you say the audience you know, received this information, I'm sure at some level, it was almost like a culture shock. Yeah, I think it, it wasn't because uh, it, it, the, actually the experts from the Dutch Cycling Embassy, we were like, we had a, like a long prep in order to bring them here and bring them on the same level as the infrastructure, because the story of cycling and walking is not really publicized in uh, about the, so, Dubai. And maybe the resources are in Arabic, maybe the Heike. So it was actually for them a little bit of to like to understand that there is cycling infrastructure. We don't have to plant the seed. There is a walking uh, infrastructure. However, we like, let's look at the other things. So then the, the interesting thing that I heard from the participants is that a lot of people were focusing and lo- thinking about infrastructure. However, people start to think about behavior change and how to uh, impact behavior change. I also wanted to focus about communication. How do we talk about cycling infrastructure and how do we talk about safety and how do we talk about changing the, the mindset? And I learned also from the participants a lot as well. I also learned the, that, uh, that sports can, that the sports council are an important catalyst in making that happen because uh, that sport council are the ones who are organizing those rides and, and, and they're organizing the sport, but they are an, a very important partner uh, and I am, uh, uh, and the police are also important partner. The police spoke about how to make it safe for everybody because uh, they deal with, I would say, 200 nationalities in the whole, and everybody comes with their mindset. Okay, and they they really brought so much to the table to talk about uh, how to how do you enforce how do you uh, inform that change in a in a in a safe and seamless uh, manner. So I've learned so much, and I think even the experts from the Netherlands also like got so much information and uh, people in the room. And I, um, it, 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 the interesting thing is that something happens after these uh, tours and you can, something magical happen. We are creating a community. So we agreed to meet later and we're going to like make it a catalyst for more workshops. However, the next, the next workshops that I will uh, organize may be more specialized. Maybe we'll do workshops for um, infrastructure and maybe we'll do workshops or specialized and maybe I'm not only talking about Dubai I want to work in my home country Jordan and I work to work around the region because development is happening all over and uh, we're not stopping here right yeah yeah that's great I think that that's just so incredible and I'm so excited and happy for you that that a you were able to pull that together and leveraging that commitment from from the cop meeting uh, because that was a, a key point to the, to that commitment was, you know, getting out and trying to, uh, you know, spread the word and, and train more people, you know, really work on that knowledge capacity building, which is, is so incredibly important. And actually, it's also like if you always talk about it and because like it, it's about community. So the, uh, like when I had the meeting with the person who introduced me to the people in the consulate, I was doing, I was working alone and the, the consulate was also t- uh, organizing this by, uh, with the ministry. So it just, it's, it's about talking to more, to more people and connecting with more people. Even if you think that it's not gonna, like nothing's gonna come out of this meeting, but uh, trust me, every time I talk to people, like my energy is like boosted. And especially when you're an entrepreneur, when you're alone, when you are like uh, creating something new, because we are the first startup in the whole region focus on walking and cycling. So it's very important to uh, build a community. And I'm so happy with the support that uh, I, ha- I have so far. I even have a, like an e-community with you and people who support me as well. I keep asking you questions and you would always like 
reply within a few hours advising me on uh, different facets of like the challenges and the opportunities that we are facing, which I am always grateful for. And it's, it's my pleasure and honor to be able to do so. And when we talk about creating a culture of activity, it, it really is agnostic to, you know, the type of activity we're talking about here, where you, you, know, you had mentioned how important it was to have this, the sports representation there at the workshop. And, and yeah, I, uh, sometimes we, we, kind of divide ourselves needlessly into these little groups of, oh, that's just sports and recreation. We're talking utilitarian, walking and biking. No, 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 no. It's all trying to encourage a culture of activity and getting us moving. And there's many different ways that we can do this, including activating public spaces like we have in this photo here. Uh, but really, it, it's it's really, you know, just whatever we can do to reinforce the that reality that as a human species, being physically active is the most natural thing that we can do. And what better way to, to be able to experience our beautiful environments and being able to, to get out into nature. Uh, and, and I just, I can't wait to come visit you one of these days. Well, I, I look forward to having to you here, you. but I'm going to have yeah. to come visit you there. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. I can't wait to host you. The, the photos that you were showing is about like uh, Dubai comes to life when the weather becomes better. And, and you, you'll be surprised that it is built to be an outdoor city. So uh, like the city is somehow like restricted in the summer, although everything is air conditioned. But in the city, in the winter months, when the weather is really good, the whole city comes to life. And one of it is a whole a month, a, a whole month. Uh, organized called the Bay 30 by 30, which is in November, whereby the government is organized, like it's it, it, from a wellness point of view, they wanted to improve the wellness and they tell people like, let's move for 30 minutes for 30 days in November. And then it triples around the whole year. And then they organize events from like obstacle racing to cycling, to uh, Ironman, to, to um, 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 as you said, the yoga in public spaces. And it, it, the, the, the whole city becomes like electrified with these amazing uh, activities. And uh, it actually boosts tourism. Yeah. Really boosts tourism. Like one time that, you know, the Ironman uh, races, Yes. They're very like, uh, they're not mainstream, you know, they're very specific. They need a lot of training. And one time they announced that they organized uh, like an uh, Ironman in Dubai. And I think the number of participants was around 10,000, which is for a city of Dubai is a lot, which means that so many people came from different parts of the world to take part of that activity. So it's actually boosting, boosting definitely boosting tourism. And uh, it's a city that uh, the, the government is well aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We need to wrap this up. So to close us out, talk a little bit about school streets and uh, and, and and why you're passionate about uh, this in the context of the work that you're doing in your region. I'm a consultant, so I'm an advisor. However, the most of the projects that I worked on throughout my different roles of my career were top down. So either a developer or a government, a government entity that's doing some work and then they implement it and, and people are just like waiting for that uh, to happen to them. However, when I started the street design team, I wanted to think about it from bottom up. So instead of like waiting for something to happen, why don't we all uh, uh, participate in improving the built environment around our, our places and uh, improve our, our lifestyle? And uh, people don't know that, you know, and they need someone like engineers to, or like some me, so who have been uh, practicing in the city space for some time to help them. However, it's not about me telling them what they need. It's about us teaming up together and letting me and, and knowing what they need. And from like, we form street design teams. And from the sport street design team, we actually start identifying their goals. And from that, their goals, we collect data, understand, like the, do some surveys with the, with the parents, and then um, identify some action plans. And usually I start with the lowest minimum intervention that can really like meet those goals and from that scale it up and then at the end we really need to also scale it uh, like tell the story and record it so that's the methodology on the right which is about building a team identifying goals and then from that identify uh, the understand empathy like empathizing with the people understanding what they need um, listing the actions and then lastly telling that story so this is a photo of, uh, like, uh, so I'm, I am working with, like I signed an MOU with one of the major school providers here in the UAE. Um, uh, and I'm working um, on uh, promoting walking and riding to schools 
and we are like we want to replicate this to a hundred schools in the region. And the, well, by saying that we are focusing on lowest hanging fruit, is that maybe the um, infrastructure change will come, maybe with the cycling network will come to this school at cert, like in five or four years time. However, like we can actually change the signal time. We can like for the, that photo is a signal, like a signal that a lot of people use it in the morning. So what we are proposing to change the signal time in the morning when people are crossing to make it more for pedestrian rather than for, uh, for, uh, for cars, at least in the peak hours in the morning. And this is a, sh- a slide showing that we surveyed the parents on, in that uh, one of the schools, and we wanted to understand from them like a, a menu of eleven reasons why don't why don't they cycle or why don't they cycle around their around to get to the school. And then we excluded the people who live more than eight kilometers away from the school because we could not actually say cater for those. We will like cater for them in a different different a different uh, maybe providing public transport or a bus route. However, we wanted to focus on the people who are really going to use the infrastructure, and they identified that 40% they wanted improvement in sidewalks, 18% they wanted improvement in, uh, in pedestrian crossings. And what I like learned from this survey is that nobody said that we need more lighting or we don't feel safe or security. They didn't say these things. They said that we need those specific items. So I learned, like I asked them, is it the weather? Is it the dust? Is it what they would say, no, we would like a shade, for example. So these are really noise, for example. They like I asked many questions, and then this is the answer that came. And then I audited the infrastructure, which is the next slide, and I asked them to say where they, the problematic areas. And based on the methodology that we developed, based on best practice from different parts of the world, we audited the infrastructure, we walked around the neighborhood, and we identified the problem areas, and they were identical to the areas that we audited. So the, actually, the people who are using the street are actually well aware where the problem areas are. And then we listed a few, uh, like a number of infrastructure changes, and now we are working on them. And the nice thing is that we're not only working on infrastructure, we're also looking at the behavior. So that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's one of the schools that uh, like we uh, I'm working with. Well, I have to, I'm laughing because it's like, oh, gee, imagine that. The people who are actually using the streets, they're the ones that know about the streets. Yeah. We just have to ask them. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And survey them. And we had, uh, I think the the school had 1,000 students. We had 300 respondents. Yeah. So we, people wanted to talk about it. It's very personal for them. So it was uh, it was really fantastic. And now I'm I'm, I'm working on rolling it on more uh, more and more um, uh, schools. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Where, where can people uh, follow up with you? And mm-hmm. is there a website that they can go to? Definitely, um, streetdesignteam.com, okay. and uh, LinkedIn is also a great way to uh, connect. Um, please give me a shout uh, to my page or to the firm page. But definitely, um, I look forward to hang- uh, to uh, to uh, engaging with people. I am not active on other forms or other right. uh, media platforms. It's mostly LinkedIn and uh, and the website. So, if people wanted to um, um, join the upcoming uh, workshops. Uh, or tell me what they want to organize the workshops on, we can do that. If a school uh, in our region or um, um, a school in the re- in, like, in the whole GCC or the whole like Middle East fa- is facing challenges, I'm happy to share the resources that I uh, talked about. And uh, yeah, I um, also, um, if someone wants to have a cycling tour or recommendations about where to walk and cycle in Dubai, I'm happy to assist. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Mm-hmm. It has been such a joy and pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's my pleasure and thank you for having me and thank you for your support, um, answering my questions and being very patient with me and being very generous with your time. Again, uh, I, I, it's truly, truly my pleasure to do that. I, it's one of the things that I love most about doing this sort of work is to help uh, spread the joy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, bring joy, more joy. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, it'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts by becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org and then click on the support button. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.
And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.